Welcome to the fourth annual Guild of Music Supervisors Conference. which is a music supervision company, and I've been doing business under that banner for, since about 2001. So it's been a long time. And lots of things have changed along the way, and we're gonna run through all of that once uh, she does her thing. Hi, I'm Lizelle Brandt. I'm an entertainment lawyer. I have helped companies start businesses for many years now, and I've actually also started my own business way back in 2007. So I'm a business owner myself as well. And delighted to be talking to you today and giving you some, I'd say, nuts and bolts initial tips. Yeah, just like a nuts and bolts. We're just gonna kind of run through. And you know, since we're small, if you got a question in the middle of it all, just ask, it's not a big deal. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get through um, as much as we can, uh, you know, with all the, the stuff that kind of just goes into the initial uh, aspect of starting a business. So, um, first off, y'all are crazy if this is really what you want to do. <laughs> um, and, you know, you got to come up with, like, uh, the basics. What's the name? Has anyone, has anyone ever used this name? Um, are you going to make a logo? The kind of simple uh, beginning aspects of just kind of uh, getting to the point of what am I, what am I going to do, what are my services, and, um, and making sure that you're doing it correctly. So. so when you talk about names and when you talk about logos and you're talking about slogans, there is an area, a body of law here that protects that and it's called trademark law. Those are all trademarks. So as we said in the beginning, you want to, you want to think of a name. What are you going to go by? What's the name of your music supervision company? Is it Early Girl Music? Uh, if you're starting a law firm, is it Sinkian Law? A uh, name that's going to um, separate you from other people, your calling card. And you don't want just anybody else to come up with a music supervision company called Early Girl Music and to do the same exact thing that you're doing. That might be a little bit confusing, confusing in the marketplace. Yes. So um, what you want to do ultimately is you want to register that with the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. So we've got an example here of Guitar Center. I like that example because you, you see you've got the logo over there, but it's also the name of the company. So that's a good one, actually. Yeah. And how much does it cost to register a trademark? I'm just going to admit that I didn't do any of this stuff. And I'm just going to admit right. that I also teach licensing at FITM, so I'm very PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> so, full disclosure here. So, how do you create it? And we'll get to cost. I heard your question. It's right there in there. So, the first thing you want to ask is if somebody else has it. Because, again, you don't want to be operating for a legal music, music supervision company. You want to check somewhere. So, I've got a website up there. It's called USPTO.gov. It stands for the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. And in that website, you're going to be able to search the U.S. trademarks. Because the first thing you want to do is make sure that your company, your proposed name, isn't already taken for music for the, for the area that you want to be in. So you go on that website, you check it, and then to your question about cost. Uh, trademarks, as far as I do in intellectual property law, it is one of the most expensive types of um, intellectual property laws to register. It's going to be $275 per application per class. And by class, I mean you can get a trademark for um, doing Arts and entertainment, that will be $275. But if you want to also use Worldly Gold Music on, say, merchandise like apparel, that's another class. That's another $275. If you want to put it on educational products, another $275. So you've got to narrow down what it is. Arts and entertainment is class 41. But, anyways, so the other thing that sucks about trademarks is that, or the application, is that there's no guarantee. You can apply, it's, it's no money back. You will spend your two hundred seventy-five dollars, and and um, and the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, that's the board, is going to make the decision as to whether or not they're going to grant you it. In other words, you can't just 
say, look, I'm the first one here, I want this trademark, I should get it. There's all sorts of complicated rules about whether or not it'd be granted. So, before you go into all the costs, a nice thing to do is just Google the name. Just put in whatever you're calling yourselves, Google it, see if it shows up anywhere, because one thing that's great about Google is it's kind of worldwide, you know, so you can kind of get an idea if someone else has used it in some other form or, or whatnot. It's a good place to kind of start at least. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that, is that trademark license if it's granted? Is it in perpetuity or do you have to renew it every so often? Another good question. We're going to get to that. Yes. Um, no. So the answer is no. Uh, it can be a uh, caveat. So, so people are wondering what kind of trademark can you get through? You're seeing on the left stronger marks. And what do you think these, these marks have in common? They're what? Unique. unique. Yeah, unique. So these are words that before you even saw your first piano or a guitar or even heard about it or shopped online for um, for industry tools, you probably have never heard of those words, right? Unique. So those are that's one of the biggest things about getting a trademark through. They need to be unique. They need to be fanciful. They can also be combinations of words that otherwise wouldn't have made sense. Like, for instance, you can put the words whirly and girl together and music, and then you suddenly have something that's it's called arbitrary. And again, that would make it stronger. Versus on the right side, you probably have seen many um, you know, strip mall areas where you see music school in this city, and then you go to the next city, you're probably going to see another thing that says music school or a piano store. The reason, they're not, they're not all owned by the same company with one trademark. Those are weaker marks that don't have a trademark, so they just let people operate them and they just do. So. Registration, again, U.S. Patent Trademark Office, the priority of the trademark. Um, surprisingly, how many of you think that you would be able to get priority because you're the first one to apply to the U.S. Patent Trademark Office? You would think that, right? The answer is no. It's actually commercial use, which means that the first person who actually is selling that stuff with that name is going to beat the person who filed it if they use it first. So what I tell all of my clients initially is if you have a great idea, just throw it on the web right now. Start selling it using that name because now you want to really prioritize getting your, your use out there because that will prioritize the person who applies on um, on the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. Now, it's good to do that just so you can let people know that you're there, but commercial use is going to be the most important thing. And if there's one thing you want to take away from today, that's actually that as far as trademarks. It's make sure you're selling it under the name and that you have proof of it because if you ever have to get in a fight with somebody else about giving the girl music, you want to be able to prove that you were selling it first, not necessarily that you applied first. Okay. Can you use a registration for a domain name that you consider using it first, so it's like a service versus T-shirts. Uh, good question. If you're, you have to be selling things. So that's why it says commercially used. You can't just be sitting on it. You no, have like to be an active use. Like you bought the domain name, you created a website, you had an email, mm -hmm. you're using it for. Yeah, for selling your services. Yes, then, then you can do that. So trademarks, they don't have to be, you know, limits. They can be names too, and then they can be your website too, which is called a cyber mark, which is also a trademark. Are those automatic, kind of like? Uh, Sorry, I'm asking questions. <laughs> um, is it automatic saying, you know, like when you actually uh, do a, uh, you know, like if you wrote, you wrote a song and you send basically the lyrics to yourself in an envelope and it's, it kind of automatically gives you like the copyright because, you know, you, you without submitting it to the right. copyright office. It's is it sign, it's proof and it kind of can serve as like, hey, yeah, this is my trademark. Right, and, and that's actually something smart that you do independent of trademarks is, um, for instance, if you're submitting a song or an idea you developed at first, I often tell my clients, that, hey, email it to somebody so that you have proof of delivery, proof that it got somewhere with real-time, you know, Gmail account, whatever it is mm -hmm. that you have, but at least you have proof because a lot of the trademark industry is going to be who sold it first, <coughs> who put it in the stream of commerce first, um, again, versus whoever filed it. So over here, and you probably have seen these two little markings on the side of many logos. Do you know what the difference is between these two? Yeah. Trademark and then registered trademark. <coughs> so which one do you think you'd want to have? 
Or the R. Okay, a lot of people probably see the TM, but you still see the TM. Do you know why you see the TM? Because this is slow. It's pending? Pending. Oh, okay. Yes, Lindsay. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, professor, great to see So it means it's pending. That's what people put when they usually have applied, but again, the U.S. Patent Trademark Office isn't going to turn it around in one day. So that's their kind of like placeholder that says, look, we're asserting rights to this, so don't use it. But it doesn't mean it's automatically be, going to be granted. When you see the R, that's when you have to watch out more. Okay? Uh, just a quick question. Um, if you have something that's not small, that's not big enough to submit, like let's say you have like a chord progression or even even more than that, that you're thinking in your own, what's the best way to um, secure it under like that it was yours and that it was your work? Well, that's a chord. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a copyright. copyright question. Yeah. Um, not like a logo or a business okay. name. So, yeah. Um, but come to the, the songwriting <laughs> later and we'll tell you about copyrights. <laughs> another, another yes, that, that's the copyrights. Uh, yes. yes. So the trademark application, that 275, is that in the name and the accompanying, like a logo? Is it yeah. just the name? That's two different, that, that's a good question. That's two different things. You want to trademark the name, but sometimes the logo, for instance, you have the company Nike, right? So the name of Nike is? And I A E, right? But their logo is not their logo is their big logo is a swoosh, right? Those are two different apps. So it's two different tra trademarks. Okay, two different trademarks. You can trademark the name, you can trademark the logo, you can trademark the slogan. Okay? All of those. Music supervision at its best. Slogan. <laughs> Earlier, somebody here had asked about duration. How long does a trademark last once you get, say, you make it through the U.S. Patent Trademark Office? Initially, it's going to last about uh, 10 years is what you're going to do. But you're going to have to keep reapplying just to prove that you're commercially using it. Make sure that you continue to sell it. And as long as you do that and you keep reapplying every few years, every 10 years, um, then you should be able to keep the trademark. As well, but if you stop using it, that's when you're going to lose it. Okay. What if you stop using it and then start using it like a year or two later? Can you reapply? And if as no one took it, okay. well, if you do stop using it, then I mean it's going to be a lot of that. It's like how long have you stopped using it? So let me give you one quick example here at USC. Um, they don't like being called Southern Cal. All right. And I don't know why, but but if you go to the USC bookstore and you look around every now and then, you will almost always see at least one sticker that says Southern Cal. The reason why you see only one one sticker that says that, and rather than a whole bunch of merchandise, is because USC owns that trademark and it wants to block anybody else from buying it and from having it, so that they go around selling Southern Cal. So that's an example of well, minimal use, just because they want to keep it. And they're going to continue to do that unless they want to risk losing it. So it's a um, random thing for the USC people here that are here. Yes. Frankie, how long were you a music supervisor before you decided to brand yourself or go with a company name? And, and what was the decision that led to that point? Um, well, the decision was I was working for uh, Polygram Films at the time, and uh, Universal Pictures bought us. And we all lost our jobs, and um, I kind of walked away with a, with a film that wasn't finished underneath the Polygram banner. So when I, you know, we all lost our jobs, we kind of just took on like the, the movies that we were working on. And, you know, so I continued to do it, but I was like, shit, I gotta come up with a name. I guess I'm gonna do this now. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I probably, maybe six months, you know, it took me to kind of do a logo, uh, do like the DBA, do, um, you know, and I wasn't getting, I, you know, I think my, my final paycheck on that movie literally was uh, to Frankie Pine. It wasn't to Whirly Girl Music at the time. Well, yeah. Yes, DBA, mm -hmm. speaking of DBAs. Um, so that's one of the things that's kind of like the easiest thing to do is you, what, you know, after you figured out what your name is going to be, you uh, do a doing business as. Um, typically, I have done this, like I've done it through um, any kind of business journal. You just basically, it's a little like blib that says, 
Uh, Frankie Pine is now doing business as Whirly Girl Music. Um, the address is whatever the address is and, you know, a date and such. And that's pretty much the extent of a DBA. Um, but apparently there's a website you can go to to do all of this, which I've not ever used. I've always uh, just kind of done it through like a business journal and sent them a little thing that says this is how I'm, this is what I'm doing. But obviously you can go to a website, you can fill this out, and um, and then they'll, they, will they submit it for you? Uh, you will, you can submit a website. When I did mine, actually, I actually walked into the LA County Reporter and uh, and I applied over there, it was a form, um, but you can do it now online as well. Okay. Um, so after, you know, you've figured out all your name and you know, you're now ready to kind of operate under this name, you kind of have to decide what kind of business you want to have. Do you want to be a sole proprietor? Do you want to be an LLC? Do you want to be uh, incorporated? Um, all of these different kinds of companies have different benefits. I mean, typically as a music supervisor, you kind of want to start with like, I'm just a sole proprietor. It's definitely the least expensive. You don't have as many like uh, tax things that you have to kind of jump through in order to kind of, uh, you know, pay your taxes. It's a lot easier if you're a sole proprietor. Um, so, it, but it, obviously as a sole proprietor, you have to, you know, really watch the amount of money that you're getting in and, you know, you have to, you're responsible for your own taxes, so you actually have to pay your taxes. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you really just kind of have to, like, make sure every time you get a paycheck, you just set it aside. And, you know, that's, that's like a big thing, I think, just in general, in kind of starting into this world of music supervision. Because we don't get paid all the time. If you are a person that needs that paycheck every two weeks, you are going to suck at this <laughs> um, because you are constantly hounding to get paid, constantly hounding to get paid. Um, you, uh, you get chunks of money. You don't get like the same amount of money each time. So uh, typically you will, I'm probably skipping ahead, am I not here? <laughs> You'll probably... Um, you know, TV shows get paid differently than films get paid. Uh, same thing, like, if, even if you're just doing, like, if you're a trailer person, you're doing that on the side, you got to call. So those, you, you get paid differently based on the kind of project that you're doing. One thing, let me add one thing as far as sole proprietorship that um, is important to know is that while it is the least expensive one to four, you are also the most liable. You're exposed the most in terms of if you get sued, you can't hide behind an LLC. You can't hide behind a corporation. So while it doesn't have its benefits up front, there are, that's one of the things you might have to worry about is individually being sued and liable. I have a question about mm -hmm. If I do a project as a sole proprietor and then later down the line become an LLC and then I get, you know, I'm on a project and a lawsuit comes up two years later, at the time I didn't, I wasn't, I was a sole proprietor, does that, anything I've done in that state, does it exist as a sole proprietor, or? That's when you get into, yeah, you'll, you'll get into fights, and that that's when lawyers will argue over what's appropriate, but generally it'll be what was your status when you, when the act of uh, because also that'll tie into, for instance, and this is another important thing, but there's another panel that says, is your liability insurance, okay? Your liability insurance will turn to, well, what was your, your status then as well? Um, so back to the business types, there's partnerships, also low cost, but you know, you got to really love that person and trust mm -hmm. that person with every ounce of your being. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there's the LLC, and you can kind of see, like, you know, we did, like, a pros and cons of, of each of, of these types of uh, different businesses. Um, I started out as a sole proprietor, and then later, after, you know, being very well established as Whirly Girl Music, I became incorporated. So, I just, you know, everybody's going to do it differently. Corporations will have the protections, real quickly, as far as partnerships. 
those are just like sole proprietorships. It's just that it's one more person. So again, you've got the liability. When you get to the LLC and corporations, you've got more protection. Um, so yeah, so the, so the next thing that's, you know, basically what I was talking about is your taxes and the way that you get paid. Everything is in chunks. Um, so if you know that you just finished a project and you don't have something kind of odd down on the horizon, you better have a wonderful savings account to kind of, you know, make sure that you can still keep paying your rent and eating and all that good stuff. Um, so one of the other things that kind of comes as, as, a, as a music supervisor is whether or not you need an agent or not. Um, I mean, I'm of the mindset that if I have an agent, I can double team things. I, you know, I don't sit back and wait for my agent to do everything for me. You have to be completely proactive in, in regards to your business. You have to be the one that's also going out there making the networking and um, as well as your agent. So what happens typically with me and my agent, you know, I'll go, I'll find out, like one of my contacts, a friend of mine is doing something, I'll be like, all right, who else do you know on the project? So that we can double team it and try to make something happen organically together. Um, <laughs> um, so... I, I think that if you go into it in the sense of that you're not expecting them to hand you your first job, your agents are great. I, I, they, they help you. They, you know, will tell you, like, look, man, there ain't shit out there right now. Everything's taken. I mean, as, as long as I think you feel comfortable with that person and you feel like you can talk to them, you know, it's, I think a relationship with an agent is a good thing to have. But also, downside is they take a cut of your money. Um, so pretty much nowadays, and Lindsay, you tell me, like, I'm still on the 10%, but that's only because I've been with the guy forever. Um, but a lot of agents are taking 20% now, which is a lot of money, you know? Too much. On something <laughs> like, you know, and nowadays, yeah, like nowadays you get a movie, you're lucky if you make... I don't know, $40,000 on the movie. Um, guess what? 20% of that is going to somebody else. So it's, it, it really is just kind of like your comfort level of, you know, do I know enough people? Am I going to be willing to pound the pavement myself to try to get those jobs and make sure that, you know, you're kind of building a name for yourself? Can you negotiate the agency fee on top of your deal or have you ever done that? Like, like how actors do no, yeah, you can't. I mean, I've never done that. It's a good idea. No. It depends on the agency. I mean, yeah, for the agency, yeah. How, how you'd be able to get around it. Usually, it's pretty strict. It's required. It's called a waiver. Yeah. Um, you know, so there. These are just all members of your team. An agent is a member of your team. Uh, do you need an assistant? Is a, is an assistant something that you need? I'm going to suggest if you're first starting out. Absolutely not. You do not need an assistant. You can, if, you, if you're working on one project, you know, you should be the creative, uh, the, uh, the business side of it, the negotiating side of it, the clearance side of it, the licensing side of it, everything. So you can learn as much as you possibly can about this job. And, you know, the job isn't just, oh, let me sit around and listen to my amazing record collection and pitch a bunch of stuff that I think is cool for this movie. Um, you know, you, you do need to have relationships with uh, licensing people. You need to uh, forge those relationships. You need, to, um, you need to be the one that when you are ready to have an assistant, that you're then teaching that person how it's done at your company so that that person is also the, fo the, the voice and the face of, of your wonderful company name. Um, you know, so there's different sides, obviously, to an assistant. And, um, you know, is the assistant an independent contractor uh, or is the assistant an employee? Because those are two different liability issues <laughs> and financial issues. Um, I mean, I can tell you from my experience, 
I started out, all of my assistants were independent contractors. I just paid them what I could pay them. And, um, you know, they did their own taxes. They were responsible for their own taxes. I didn't, I didn't provide any of, uh, like, insurance, any of that stuff. And it's one of those things of, at least it was when I started, is you're paying your dues, you're learning how to do it, and then, you know, then you can fight the fight to become an employee or become a partner or become, you know, a mainstay within the, the particular company. Okay. You want to uh, do this part? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, so you're probably wondering, employee, independent contractor, what's the difference between the two? And most of you are probably thinking an employee, you have a W-2. An independent contractor, you have a what? 1099, right? Do you think that that is um, determinative of, of your status? The answer here in California is not necessarily. One of the things that's important for you to know is whether you're an independent contractor, an employee, or an employer is that California is a very employee-friendly state. And, and so the legal presumption, what California will presume, is that somebody is an employee, presumed, um, even if you call them an independent contractor, unless you show that there are elements that they are an independent contractor. And why does this matter? It's because, you know, for obvious reasons, Frankie, why would you ha hire somebody as an independent contractor versus an employee? I have less responsibility for that person. Right? <laughs> yes. So, you don't deal with payroll yeah, taxes? Yeah, no payroll taxes, no, um, uh, there's no, uh, any kind of like, um, Unemployment insurance, those kinds of things that are all part of like having a an employee that you have to provide for them, and Social Security and all that other good stuff, you know. So, so. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, like, quick question: You mentioned California is a very employee-friendly state. Mm -hmm. I'm a little different because I'm a licensing agency, but it's my own company. If I had an assistant or a 1099 person who does fulfill all those 1099 requirements, but lives in New York. Is she a New York employee or, you know what I mean? Because tagging and uploading stuff, which I think probably music supervisors need too, <laughs> that can be done from anywhere. So like, I don't know how. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and the answer to that question is that lawyers are the ones who, uh, oh, no, no, Congress create laws, a lot of them are lawyers. So there's this rule called the first to file. So if you think a lawsuit could be either in California or New York, because you mentioned your assistant is in New York, maybe they could file in New York. but the person, the lawsuit is going to turn on where is this filed and where is this filed first. So I'll give you an example. Um, Katie Holmes, Tom Cruise, they're divorced, right? She filed in New York. She filed in New York because New York has more family friendly to what she wanted to do states. Even though they also live in California, but she could have filed in California. She filed it first. So she, whoever She's files it venue. first picks the jurisdiction, okay? So you, New York, California, yes, they either might apply. Um, and when that's the case, it's going to be the first to file because, again, these are laws that are encouraged by lawyers and lawyers encourage lawsuits, so whoever goes first. Um, this is where I'm going to tell you it's a good idea to take a photo of these next few slides um, because if you're an employer, if you're an employee, if you are an independent contractor and you just want to know what factors are there, what are going to be considered as far as if you're a, really an independent contractor or not, there's eight of them. So these are the first four. And there's, because there's no black or white, it's just going to determine turn on a lot of different things, you know. Is it part of the regular business of the principal? Like, for instance, Frankie, if you hire an independent contractor, are they basically going to be doing the same work that you would be doing? So that would be one of the factors. Who supplies the tools, instruments, and place that, they do, that you're doing for work? Are they going into your office, this independent contractor, or are they able to do the work from their own environment and their location? Again, if they're going to your location, that's looking more like an employee. If they're doing this from their own place with their own tools, more independent contractor. Um, investment in equipment. Are they using, again, your equipment? Are you paying for them to have, uh, you know, classes, seminars? Are you upgrading their equipment? If you're doing more of that, then more like employee. But if they're, if they're buying their own equipment, more independent contractor. Um, special skills looking more like an independent contractor. So that's the first of the eight. Next is that one again. I encourage you to take pictures of this. Um, so it's again, how much supervision do you have over, over there? How permanent is the working relationship? Are you calling them an independent contractor, but they're coming in 
you know, five days a week for a period of over a year, what is your monthly payment? Are you paying them bi-weekly, regular hours, 40 hours a week, sounding more like an employee versus an independent contractor? Um, and then the last is what kind of relationship they um, believe that they're in. And again, these are just factors that, in the law, you look at it as kind of like a weight scale. So this, these are a lot of factors, not one is determinative, but a lot kind of slanting one way might make it look more like an independent contractor. But it is pretty important, because again, it's one of the things as you start up your own company that you're gonna wanna consider. Okay. Um, one of the things also, too, that I think is, you know, once you kind of get established a little bit more, is having a business manager. Um, meaning like the person that kind of is, you're in and out of money. Uh, you know, when you're getting paid, uh, you know, this also is a person that can really help you with whether or not be doing an independent contractor versus an employee uh, a decision comes up because, you know, you may not have the money to shell out to pay an employee. Um, I mean, I can tell you that I have done this all like under the radar <laughs> for a really long time. And at one point, my business manager came to me and he goes, you got to get legit. And I was like, all right, now's the time to get legit. So I now have an employee. We do all the stuff that, you know, uh, you know, like an incorporated company uh, has to do. So, um, you know, if you're by yourself, you're, and you're, you know, you're basically just going from one project to one project to the next, you don't really need to worry about this kind of stuff so much. Once you start getting more busy and things start, you know, the name is getting out there, the more that you are uh, making the rounds, the more that you're in the light, the more that you want to try to get things on the legitimate side of things. But no, you can get away with it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, and my cell is over there going, la, 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 la. <laughs> It is not something that I obviously would legally advise. Yes, sometimes you can get away with it. I will tell you this, Uncle Sam is no joke. No joke when you get caught and no joke not, not, not pop, but no, no joke once they brought a focus on you, because then you're looking at this year after year that they're now looking at you. So, yeah. Um, so, was that what influenced your decision to go from sole proprietor to yes. S Corp, I assume? Or C -Corp? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, and even then, I still kind of did it as a uh, independent contractor. And then, you know, just with the amount of work that was coming in, he was just like, you just can't, you just can't do it like that anymore. And, you know, so we, we switched it up. Was it partly income-based then too? Or yes. Partly? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, there's benefits to when you when you have, you know, a certain amount of income coming in, paying out certain kind of taxes, you know, it's, it was, it was that weighing of, you know, good versus evil kind of thing and said, all right, you, you need to go in this in this direction. One more thing, this is another thing where I again would recommend you take a photograph of the slide. Um, as, as you start your own business, and because I know we have a lot of students over here from USC, um, one of the things that makes a lot of financial sense would be having an unpaid entry, because why? Free work. Okay. Free work, right? Get one from college. The problem is there's a lot of yeah legal problems here. So um, if you're not doing it right, there's, there are good ways to have insurance and then there's ways that are just legal. So under the Fair Labor Standards Act, there are, yes, more criteria. These are six different criteria that are going to determine whether or not your unpaid internship, whether you are the intern yourself or if you're the company that is hiring the unpaid intern is possibly illegal. Uh, the main thing, the gist of it, is that the, the unpaid internship needs to primarily benefit who? The intern. The intern, okay, that's the big thing. So you you can't really be hiring them to replace real work um, 
for a certain period of, of time. Um, you need to be focused on training them. So and that's why it's un and that's why it's unpaid. So you want to look at how much training you're on, you're, you're you're doing with them, how much experience they're getting versus the you know free work that you're getting. Um, but these are it's, uh, six different factors, and um, again the main thing is that it needs to primarily benefit them. You need to give them hand hands work hands on experience. Um, you need to give them give them training, even if it interferes with your the work of your company. So they really need to be the ones if it's unpaid that are coming out ahead, not you. Um, a lot of another thing that may factor into this is, for instance, the two-year unpaid internship duration. Because probably by two years they they would have learned already. They should have been trained, and you probably would have been able to make a decision as to should you hire them more long term. That's unpaid internships again. Something to consider. How does insurance like like get involved in this? Like if there's like a Something happens to the intern while they're with you on their unpaid internship, and they get hurt. That. That's when you're dealing like with possible workers' comp claims again, and that's where you know, regardless of what you want to call this, that's why I say the whole. Well, this is going back to the 1099 and independent contractor. If they can argue their way to be an employee and to get. Uh, you know, workers' comp, then you're going to ha be having to deal with that as well. Um, so there was, I know, an insurance seminar earlier today that probably developed this a little bit more. Um, but the the big thing with that is it's, it's called course and scope, scope of employment. If somebody's doing something in relation to how they were working for you, and they get into a car accident, they hurt somebody, then it, they'd probably be able to attach a claim to you. And that's why, I mean, we need to get to that, but insurance is so important. I don't have it. I was gonna ask. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, did you do this? <laughs> Lizelle's over here going, geez, we need to do this with her. Uh, <laughs> insurance, the reason why insurance is good is because sometimes they will they will handle your legal defense because lawyers are not cheap. They're not. Usually they'll work if you're being sued, they're not gonna take it on contingency, which means I'm just gonna take it and get a percentage because you're not making money. You're being sued. Somebody's trying to get money from you. Lawyers will only take it on an hourly defense basis, which means you're paying them X amount per hour. Usually, at least, if you're lucky, at least two hundred and fifty to three hundred per hour. But on the regular end, you're looking at four hundred and fifty, five hundred, upwards to you know nine hundred dollars per hour for them to defend you. So it's nice to have an insurance in there where then you've got the insurance who is hiring the law firm to defend you and, and it's the insurance company that's paying for it. So I say insurance all the way. What I, could, I wouldn't I wouldn't get on the road without uniform insurance. Yes. <coughs> what kind of insurance are you referring to then in this case? Liability insurance. Liability. So you want okay. liability insurance um, that makes sure that covers you know you is especially for the owner. You want to make sure that it covers usually usually you want to I would say get at least a million dollars of coverage because people will sue. And in this in this economy, usually in down economies, I'll tell you this, people are more likely to sue because they're looking at that as a way to make money because they're not working or what, whatever, and they're down time, so let me file a lawsuit to supplement my income, whatever it is that they do, yes. So you need workers' comp for uh, interns? Uh, I, it's, it doesn't hurt to get it. You'd, I would consult with the insurance, um, with an insurance company on that. I, my view on this is, is get as much insurance as you can afford based on what you have employees you have because again you will be responsible if an intern is called is if they're acting within the course and scope of their employment for you so if you're you know if you have an intern that's you know, I don't know that's helping you supervise them and they had to go somewhere else to find an artist or something like that so they were <laughs> driving there because you, know, <laughs> you don't see this much these days but they get into a car accident then then you're you're looking into a possible lawsuit as a result of that and you want to make sure that you do have insurance covering that Okay. I think also I was an intern, unpaid intern at a big company, but I was enrolled in school. So I think in some way maybe I was covered under the school's students. A lot of schools Policy now are actually a lot of schools now are, are requiring intern uh, placements that they get at least a million dollars in liability. And it's not that expensive either. I it's just sometimes really school, hard to get. It's kind yeah. of, you can argue that it's, it's a school. school. I can see yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Interesting. That's an interesting theory. Yeah, you're getting credit for it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because in be some way they have to. Yeah. Yeah. And they're they're requiring in some places they're requiring you to have the internship. So I could see liability attached to this one too. Um. Okay. So 
Bottom line, <laughs> there's a lot of responsibilities to being a business owner, as you have heard. Um, you have lots of corporate filings once you become like incorporated. Um, you know, again, responsibilities along the way. And these are things that are really great for you. Like if you do have a business manager that takes care of these things, making quarterly estimated payments, uh, payroll taxes, um, annual tax payments, city tax, any kind of permit you might need to, um, when I first started, I had a place in Santa Monica and I kept getting these things sent to me from Santa Monica, um, asking me to pay taxes because I was doing business in Santa Monica. Well, I went like, oh no, I'm not doing business in Santa Monica, I'm doing business in LA. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, two years later I get something, you're doing business in LA? Oh no, I'm doing business in Santa Monica. I'm covering my ears right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but just know that there are lots of responsibilities that come along with it. And um, there's plenty of surprises. This business is a very small community. We all love each other and look out for each other and, um, I always say it's always about relationships. So if you have really great relationships with people, you're probably going to do just fine as a music supervisor. Um, so I don't know. Anything else we want to throw in there? <laughs> I had, I had a, something about the business license that I've learned. But yeah. I had to do it in three different cities. Los Angeles has you can get a up to three hundred thousand uh, dollars waiver. Uh, so if you're making less than three hundred thousand dollars, they'll allow you to not have to pay. You still have to file your your city taxes on that. Culver City does not have the same waiver. I've learned, but uh, but you have to do it by the end of February. Yes, which is the yes. hardest place to remember. Are you Culver City? No, I just mean LA. LA. I do yes. it every year. Yes, <laughs> and you can go in there, and I always sweat them. Like I promise, I'm of the arts because it's like an arts waiver yeah. or something like that. And I'm always like, yes, music supervision is an art. Please continue to buy that. Mm -hmm. art yeah. So you're saying you don't pay the city tax if you get if you earn under three hundred thousand? Well, they have you have to be qualified under as a certain like like musicians will get that for certain. Uh -huh. Music supervision is a gray area, but you still have to go in and file it. And you you argue that you're of these creative types that will get a waiver up to three hundred. I think it is. It's, yeah, it's not that hard. It's not uh, that hard. I but you have to do it by a certain date. And if you don't, they'll tax you for every day you and were late. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. For the city tax that you were supposed to have paid yeah. for those dates. But if you, they give you like a freebie if you do it within the first two months of the yeah. year. Culver City doesn't have the waiver, but it, it was only, I think I only had to pay like, I don't know, something like that. And Culver City too. <laughs> so I was like, wait, LA does what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, I, I mean, in the insurance we were talking about, is that, was that mostly applied toward like employees, or is that like you know insurance for if you're liable or what? Your contracts, your agent should be doing a contract that you are not responsible okay. for any if if something all of a sudden is now under ownership from somebody else and you've got approval from Joe Blow and now Joe Blow doesn't own it anymore and they're coming after the movie to try to stop the movie from coming out, you you should not be responsible for that. There you are, should be on the production scene. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that because a lot of what we're doing is we're dealing with intellectual property that is somebody else's intellectual property yeah. and they should have that clearance then. Okay. They should be insured nevertheless. Okay in terms of mostly for your employees, people that you have yeah. under you, or if you are at a, you know, you've got a location, slip and fall, wherever it is that you're located, so you've got premises okay. liability yeah. insurance as well, but yeah, make sure that your okay. contracts are called an indemnification clause, that they've got that clause in there that says that if it's due to somebody else's fault because they didn't get their clearances right, they didn't get their licensing right, that it's not on you, okay? So from the point of view, I'm a little different from a licensor. From the point of view um, of ownerships, you know, like you said, it's intellectual property. 
I've had artists who swear, I mean, I have my artists verify three different ways that this isn't their own intellectual property. First, they have to sign an agreement with me that says they'll tell me if there's third parties involved and they have to attach a list to show me, they have to fill out the song schedule, and then when I send out a quote request, I say, I just want to verify that you own 100% of the master and 100% of the publishing or whatever. So I have them verify that with me three different ways, and I don't know if supervisors are supposed to, I mean, they just ask me once, no one's ever asked me three times. But I'm wondering, in terms of liability coverage, like, I, I still need to apply for it because I'm a relatively new agency. Is there anything else that someone like me should be doing in order to protect yourself from liability? Other than getting a paper trail and saving everything? I mean, just practically speaking, what I would do is I would just make sure that the people, unless they're establishing, you know where they're coming from, that they do have their own liability insurance. Every single artist on a roster should have their own liability insurance? In terms, well, whoever it is that's dealing with them, that you're dealing with, that they make sure that they do have it. So if you're dealing with a, whoever's representing them, so. Like um, a label or yeah, like their own. Yeah, label, label manager. Make sure that they have insurance. Um, that will cover because if, if they're gonna intellectual property liability going to stem from them, you want to make sure that they're covered. But also that um, because of that, they have it that they can indemnify you. So if you get called. Oh, I saw the indemnification clause. Yeah, I mean every record contract that an artist has that you know, and any deal that you make with the label in the contract, the licensing says that we we're saying we own this one hundred percent, basically. A lot, sometimes you'll see, you'll see both an indemnification clause, but it's also called a warranties clause. It's called by warrant that this is legit, this is clear, there's nothing wrong with it, there's no cloud, um, I haven't stolen it, things like that. Okay, it's, it's called a warranties clause. I want to make sure that yours is nice and strong. Okay, anything else? Okay, so Go out there. <laughs> Start supervising. Oh, I do have a random question. Yes. Do DBAs need to be renewed too? Oh, yeah. Not unless you change it, unless you change your name. You change right. it, but basically the city's just gonna wanna know because DBA is usually you know, it's gonna attach to whatever form you want. If you're a sole proprietor, it's just they just wanna make sure that they've got your tax. But like one of them. You know, you they find you can they the find you to tax you as No, I mean like every ten years was was with the other one you were saying you have to uh, that's yeah, that's the trade well that's okay. the trademark registration. So the trademark you do have to renew it. Um you wanna file to make let them know that you're still using it. Um but no, the DBA is you file once. Unless you change your information, you what you do is if you change your location, you change your name, you change whatever it is you're called, they just wanna make sure that they can still tax you and find you. So so they okay. you know, can they find you well, as your contact? Still paying the taxes, so I think yeah. I <laughs> they found you. They yeah. found me. So that, and that's all but that's I did move. Should I be re should I be telling them? Oh uh, yeah. yes. Like you, you want to go on that website your, you said. Yeah, you want to okay. update your your address, your contact information. Or if you want to avoid city tax. Well, I've already done that. You can avoid it. <laughs> move. <laughs> Just move. No, I'm doing business in New York. Thanks. Yeah. Theo Box qualified for you doing business in New York City. You said what? Theo Box. Uh, you may run into trouble with okay. just a few box. I would yeah, put it as, as, as a, you know, something to hang your hat on. I mean, could you get away with it? Maybe, but if you get caught, you're looking at problems. All right, guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.